Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains... Inadequate? Well, that made me feel bad about myself. And today, we are going to discuss... Locomotives that, um, well, really, they, they have some traits, some some attributes, shall we say, that seem unnecessary, and it's almost as if someone somewhere might just be compensating for something. I'm not going to say what, because I don't know what. It just feels that way whenever these locomotives are uh, taken into account. These are five locomotives. That seem to be compensating for something. The Iranian Railways AD-43C, which I am going to call the 43C just to make my life easier. These diesel electric locomotives were actually designed by Alstom, who also built the first 20 units, although other companies like Wagon Pars and Desa Diesel worked on the remainder. A total of 120 were produced, their Cocos, and production first started in the year 2000. The Islamic Republic of Iran Railways was looking for a new mixed traffic locomotive. They wanted a diesel that could do both passenger and freight service. GEC Alstom won the contract in 1998, and they delivered the 43C. They utilized a, on paper, powerful engine, the RK215, which should have been able to run at about 3,860 horsepower, or 2,880 kilowatts. But the engine actually was trash as well as the turbocharger, so they had to derate it. Three variants of this locomotive were produced. The passenger variant can hit 93 miles per hour, and the two different freight versions can reach about 68 miles per hour. Due to the reliability issues associated with the design, though, mostly because of that blasted engine, even the passenger versions were later reassigned to freight duties. And a few of them are still in service as of now, but uh, only about a third of them, as of 2016 anyway. See, because of those reliability issues I mentioned, most of the out-of-service locomotives had to be cannibalized for good working parts to fix other locomotives. You're probably wondering, though, how are these locomotives compensating for anything? They don't seem that outlandish. I mean, they're bad. Why aren't these on the worst trains ever? That is an excellent question, and I will answer it. It has nothing to do with their total power output or their top speed or anything like that. Because their actual top tier power output with the turbocharger is only about 4,300 horsepower, which is fine for a freight locomotive, but it's their tractive effort. Due to the way Alstom designed them, their tractive effort is insane. I mean, stupid, woefully unnecessary. Their tractive effort is rated at 122,000. That's more than the Chesapeake and Ohio Allegheny class, just so we're clear. Uh, Iran? Uh, serious question, and follow me on this, why do you need that much tractive effort? I mean, to be fair, if these locomotives actually worked, they don't, but if they did, a high tractive effort is a good thing, I'm just wondering, uh, why? Especially when everything else about them seems pretty middle of the road. It's just weird. The Electroputer LE5100 which I'm also going to shorten to just the 5100, or CFR Class 40, 41, 42, as this electric locomotive actually encompasses three different classes for the Romanian railways. Oh yeah, we got Romania in here! That's two more countries knocked off my list. Excellent. Here's the thing about these, though. For their time and their era, mind you, the initial ones were built between 1965 and 1966. These things, um... Yo. I don't know what Romania was doing. I don't know why they felt they needed something like this. Because looking at it, it doesn't look like anything super exciting. It looks fine, certainly for a European electric locomotive. Nothing inherently special on the surface. No, that is a lie. These things are quite possibly the most powerful locomotives, period, of the 1970s. In the Class 42 version, they were capable of 120 miles per hour, 200 kilometers an hour. Their power output was 6,800 horsepower, and their tractive effort, CONTINUOUS tractive effort, I really need to stress this, was 93,000 pounds. Question, 
Romania. <clears throat> Why? What on earth did you need that for? Any of that? Now, given the context, it being Romania in the 70s, that does sound like way more than is necessary. But to be fair, these locomotives were insanely good. They're so good that they're still using them now. Oh yeah, these things are still in service in some capacities. Drivers found them great. They were incredibly easy to work with. They rode well, and again, they were very powerful. It would pull both passenger and freight trains effectively. Quite how it turned out that good, I don't know, but I guess there's a new meme out there. Precision Romanian Engineering. The MTAB Ior? Eeyore? Please tell me it's Eeyore, because that would be great. I'm gonna go with Eeyore, just because, but this is a Swedish locomotive. Initially built by Adtrans, and then by Bombardier. They were specifically designed for a Swedish mining company. LKAB, or rather their railway division, Mom Traffic. Now, to their credit and defense, they are designed to haul very, very, very heavy trains. Iron ore, to be precise, in all weather situations. So it being extremely powerful probably isn't that surprising, but I don't think you understand how powerful these are. Their continuous horsepower rating is 7,200, and their tractive effort is 130,000 pounds continuous. Now, I completely understand the need for a really powerful electric locomotive to deal with iron ore trains, but yo, that didn't need to be that much. Is that, is that that necessary? I mean, it must, because I've seen pictures of it with two of them in the front. Well, two of the sets. They operate in pairs. And starting, they can actually hit 160,000 pounds by utilizing something called boost mode. It makes it easier for them to get really heavy trains started, and again, to be fair, they do need to pull really, really, really heavy trains, so perhaps these aren't necessarily compensating for much, but I really just wanted to talk about them because, frankly, I just gotta give Sweden props for having just an insanely powerful electric locomotive up there. That's nuts. These are Cocos. Are you guys sure you need that? I'm just checking. Virginian Railways number 700, the XA class. Oh, no. No. Okay, now we're getting into some serious overcompensation here. Why? No, not again. How many times have I talked about triplexes? Look, anything beyond a duplex I want nothing to do with. Is it cool? Possibly. Does it work well? No. 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 We know that. This didn't work. But, um, I do think it's important to stress that, uh, this does seem to be compensating for something. Dunno what, like I said, but this one really does. Now, you're probably aware that there are a few others, like Erie, that also wound up with triplexes they tested out. Uh, none of them worked. The XA, I single out because it, in particular, was more powerful than the others, and not by an insignificant amount. It was constructed by Baldwin, and I really want to stress this next part, in 1916. The reason why these dates have been so important to me is that Trains have gotten longer over the years, for obvious reasons. As more freight gets put on them, as more powerful locomotives come out that can pull that freight, they can make the trains longer. It's just more efficient to do it all at once. But in 1916, you didn't necessarily need that much power. I mean, sure, they wanted more, but there was a point when the excess power was kind of meaningless, as the trains just weren't as long back then, or necessarily as heavy. But it did not stop number 700 from coming into existence. It's a 28884, and it weighed 532 metric tons. Its horsepower is actually a complete mystery. Seriously, some sources say no one knows this thing's horsepower, which is hilarious to me. But we do know what its tractive effort was. This thing, again, 1916, could supply 166,600 pounds. That's 741 newtons. Virginian. Serious question. <clears throat> what for? You didn't need that. You absolutely didn't need that much power. I don't believe you for a second. The XA, however, like all the triplexes, was ridiculously unsuccessful. Its tracted effort was stupid, but it had no speed in any way. The average speed it operated at was between 3 and 5 miles per hour. Some sources say it got as high as 10, but uh, my point is you could outrun this locomotive. The only thing the triplexes ever seemed to be good for was banking, helping really heavy trains get up hills. In that regard, you could use them, 
but they still were ridiculously inefficient due to their high maintenance cost. The XA wound up being sent back to Baldwin, as the Virginian just didn't want it, and it was taken apart in 1920 and converted into a 2880 and a 282. Those two engines actually survived until 1953, though neither were preserved. It does mean that some usefulness came out of this display of overcompensating power. So what could top a triplex? Well, how about a Malay? A 21010 Malay. Now, Malay has come up occasionally on here, and they were an interesting design for a locomotive. Some people get them mixed up with simple articulates like the Big Boy, because they look very similar at a glance, and even I have done that historically. But it's not quite correct. The reason why Malays are different isn't that they're not articulated, they are. It's that Malays recycle their own steam. The first bit of steam goes into one cylinder, and then instead of releasing it, it moves it to the second cylinder, so it can move that one as well. It's a unique idea, and some locomotives were okay with this setup. This ain't one of them. This is the ATSF 3000 class, built between 1911 and 1912. Santa Fe actually built them themselves. There were probably about five of them, those sources aren't clear how many they made. I only assume five, because Santa Fe built this hodgepodge of madness out of ten 2 Baldwin-built locomotives. You'd need at least two of the 2102s for just one of these. That's why I assume there must have been five. Anyway, these are terrible. For the same reason that the triplexes were, believe it or not, they were ludicrously powerful for their time. Again, 1912 is when they were introduced, so they predate the Virginian triplex. This thing's tractive effort, stressing this, 1912 was 111,600 pounds. 496 newtons. In 1912! I mean, the blasted thing weighed 400 tons! They could go a bit faster than the XA, and by that I mean between 10 and 15 miles per hour, before they lost steam. Their boilers just weren't enough to fuel their never-ending thirst for more unnecessary, unspeakable, unstoppable, overcompensating power! And as a result, they were only good for helping other trains get up hills. Though, believe it or not, the 3000 class is one of two times where this wheel configuration was attempted. The other one was done by... Oh no, it's the Virginian again. This time they called it the AE. Why? Why would you do it again? No, Virginian, stop! Will your bad science never cease? These ten locomotives were built in 1918 by Alco. They were heavier than Santa Fe's attempt, and they were more powerful. Yes, even more powerful, because why not? They were designed to be operated as Malays, and in that form, they supplied about, oh, you know, 147,200 pounds, but believe it or not, they could go even higher, because they had a weird setting when they started. They could operate like simple articulates, and that boosted their power output even further to 176,600 pounds in 1918 because you really needed that. Although amazingly, they actually got away with all this. No, really, the AEs worked, and worked pretty well. They remained in service until the 1940s, though none were preserved. They are also notable because of their boilers. If you've noticed, they got really fat, big chunkus boilers over there. And that's because their boilers have the largest diameter of any locomotive ever, period, seriously. It measured 112 and 7 8 inches, or 2,867 millimeters, and their tenders had to be designed to be a lot smaller just so they could fit on turntables, which is hilarious to me. Kind of wish one of these was preserved, though. It'd be awesome. And with that, a special thank you goes to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267 Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoff 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, the Metal for Life guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian Pretzer, Twin Fox, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Major Klutz, and Ty Hammonds Jr. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual Lafon, farewell.